This episode is sponsored by Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. How do they do it? Like us, Girls Can Crate believes that real women make the best heroes. And every month they deliver them to your doorstep. This episode is also brought to you by our Patreon supporters, Craig Williamson, Jill Harrigan, Heather McKinnon, Ellen Gross, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Maria Carla Sanchez, Jamie Lang, Mandy Booty, Caitlin McTaggart, Lindsay Cummings, Monique Herrick's Pexado, and Ellie McDonald. Huge thanks to all of our patrons. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. Today, I am going to tell you the story of a witch. <gasps> Yay! I don't need to know anything else about her. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> and she is officially a witch. Okay. She was convicted of witchcraft. Oh. In fact, she was the last person in the UK ever convicted oh. of witchcraft under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. She was very well known for her ability to speak to the dead. Ooh. To bring spirits back from the <gasps> dead. Oh. To produce ectoplasm from the beyond. I see. So we're not in the 1700s. Ah. I would guess we're in the golden age of spiritualism. Ah, so when would that be? Oh, golden age? I don't know. I'm going to place it right after World War I. Pretty good guess. Wrong. Ooh. She was convicted of witchcraft in 1944. (gasps) Oh. What? Really? Yes. <laughs> 19. What? 44. And found guilty? Found guilty under <laughs> the Witchcraft Act of 1735. No. We're breaking some timelines here yeah. about what we usually think we're talking about here. What in the world? Both in terms of witchcraft and in terms of spiritualism. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking Temperance Lloyd, Mary Trembles, Susanna Edwards. 1682. All wonderful witches. Yes. And like kind of the end of witch burnings. Like all generic histories say, and then things calmed down, you know. And then Salem went nuts, and then nobody was burned as a witch anymore. And she wasn't burned. Oh. Was she killed? She wasn't even hanged. Was she killed? You'll see. (gasps) Well... I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Usually when we're talking about spiritualism... Yeah? We are talking 19th century, maybe early 20th century. Yeah. Very uh, Victorian vibe that we're going for here. And usually we are talking about spiritualist mediums in terms of how did they fake this yeah and there is plenty of that in this episode oh good i just love that i don't know why i'm so fascinated but i am it's brilliant they were brilliant but also what if she wasn't faking (laughs) now my guest for this episode is very appropriate for the subject matter her name is Nikki Drews. Oh, Macabre London. Yes. Mm. One of my very favorite podcasts, Macabre London. Fun. She is the host, and I first learned about Helen Duncan from her podcast, and I totally fell in love, went down the rabbit hole, and knew I wanted to share this story with our listeners, and Nikki Drews very graciously agreed to come and tell that same story here. Cool. My name is Nikki Drews and I am from the Macabre London podcast. I'm a storyteller and I'm big into history and just making sure that people's stories are always retold. I also have a YouTube show as well, also including a new sort of thing that I'm doing at the moment called Macabre Mini Mysteries, which is a little show which isn't London based, but is from the whole of the world. And it's great. Ah, thanks very much. (laughs) Helen Duncan was featured on episode five of my podcast and listening back to the 
podcast today, I realised I had a cold when I did that episode because I was speaking very heavily through my nose. (laughs) You just sounded more American. (laughs) Helen Duncan was born in Perthshire, Scotland Ah. to a very devout Presbyterian family. And if anyone knows about Scots Presbyterianism, Mm -hmm. it's quite severe and quite morally upright and there are no shenanigans going on. Right. We're taking this life seriously. Extraordinarily seriously. Right. And it is not at all the kind of family where one would expect to find a baby medium. A baby medium. Helen Duncan appears to have been gifted from a very early age. What? She used to tell fortunes in the playground, which I can only imagine would have been very, very popular amongst all of her classmates. (laughs) Basically earned herself a reputation from a young age as being gifted as a spiritualist and very much being able to commune with the dead. And of course, you can see this absolutely. This would be a hit on any schoolyard playground, of course. right? But it wasn't just the children that were taking this very seriously. She would read fortunes for her teachers. Ah. School administrators would come to her for advice on upcoming decisions. Ah. She appears to have been something from a very young age. She was doing something that people recognized as unusual and something that they wanted to be part of. Wow. I would have thought the grown-ups would freak out and shut it down. Well, that's what her mom was doing. Okay. Her mother was deeply worried. This is blasphemous. This Mm -hmm. is dangerous. Yeah, it's probably Satan talking, right? Oh, yeah. And you should absolutely not be trying to talk to the dead under any circumstances. Which is quite interesting, really, given that I'm not quite sure where Helen would have picked it up from to be involved in that sort of thing. Surely she must have, at some point, either learnt of it or maybe she was just gifted and she did just pick up from it at a young age. But yeah, a little bit disconcerting. So as she grew up, she continued down the path of spiritualism despite what her mother said. And she used to carry out seances and basically started doing them at her home in Scotland. She was so good at reaching and channeling the dead that she picked up one of my favourite nicknames ever. She became known as Hellish Nell, which I thought was a lovely name. (laughs) I mean, it's... The great, I aspire to have a nickname as cool as Hellish Nell. Yeah. Wow. Hellish Nell. So during that time, a lot of people set out to actually denounce seances. And it was quite a popular practice to um, basically pick apart these seances. Even Harry Houdini didn't like seances. Obviously him being in that world anyway and being a magician and an escapologist. He knew that there was some kind of trickery at play. And for the majority of people that did this, unfortunately, it was a lot of trickery at play. We talked about this quite a bit in our Adelaide Herman episode, of course, because she was also out there debunking mediums yeah. um, and felt really strongly that this was not okay to use magic to actually deceive people. Yeah. Man, fastest growing religion in the world at the time. Oh, well, yeah. maybe not her time. But before her time. Yeah, at one point, (laughs) the largest religion in the United States. More people were spiritualists than Christians. Yeah. Oh, awesome. And one very interesting thing that came from that time was that there were a lot of experiments to do with seances and spiritualism. And somebody called Thomas Bradford set up the ultimate experiment and he decided that he would tell his friend that he was going to commit suicide and then come back to talk to him as a ghost. And so one night he decided to go to bed and he put his gas oven on um, without lighting it and said that he would be back the next morning to talk to him via a seance. And understandably, he didn't come back, (laughs) which is very sad. They left it 48 hours and then decided that the experiment was a failure. 
Oh, this is a pretty good illustration. You you can see why people like Adelaide Herman and Houdini were concerned about this. People are making some pretty major decisions based on this belief system. Mediums charged a lot of money back then for their services because to the common people, they were complete magicians. They were able and had this gift to be able to, to talk to people in the afterlife, which, you know, most people didn't have the gift to be able to do that. And so it was quite a business boom as well. And so a lot of people obviously saw this and decided to get in on the practice and that's where a lot of these fraudulent mediums came from. And as these fraudulent mediums start getting better stage effects, mm -hmm. and a lot of them very much are stage shows. These are ghosts flying around yeah. the hall, things flying across the stage. Yeah. I see fingertips on your shoulder. Musical instruments playing themselves. Yes. Oh, my favorite is a ghost horn where ghosts speak through just a levitating horn. Yes. At this point, you can't just talk to dead people if you don't have a, a show. Mm. If you can't physically produce ghosts to talk to, why would anyone bother? All right. If Helen Duncan wants to stay in the game, she has to move with the times. Mm. Helen was sort of coerced into maybe upping her game at that point because these other mediums had amazing stage shows. You know, they were making ghosts appear, tables were levitating, they were flying around the room, all these, you know, incredible things that were happening. And obviously they were all trickery, so it's not really known whether there was some actual truth to it or whether she was encouraged to suddenly start upping her game. If she is the real thing, she can't compete with the fakers. Ah, huh. So her seances get fancier. She used to sink into a trance, a very, very deep trance, actually. And she used to then contact her spirit guide, who was usually a gentleman by the name of Albert. Usually, of course, a medium would have a spirit guide who mm. is the intermediary spirit who kind of introduces everyone else who comes to talk. Uh -huh. Hers is Albert. Okay. He is quite remarkable. Helen Duncan has a very thick Scots accent. Albert's voice is British accent, heavy, strong, commanding. Mm. And during one of her seances, Albert is the one addressing the audience while Helen is in a trance. He is asking questions of the audience and introducing people. And occasionally, Helen in her trance will have conversations with Albert. Ha! Huh. There's audio of this. Yes! It's amazing. <gasps> so have a listen to this. Next person to come here, I want someone so strange, isn't it? <laughs> But that's, that's her having a full-on conversation with herself there. That's when she's talking with Albert's voice, which is the, the man's voice, and then she's talking afterwards. That's her having a, a proper full-on conversation with herself. Wow. This would be convincing to me. These are two different people speaking, yeah. al almost speaking over one another sometimes. How are both of these people speaking at the same time, ah. it's very top-notch spiritualist medium going on here. Wow. Ah, but her visual effects were not great. <laughs> there were other things in Helen's seances that were quite amusing. After she'd finished talking to Albert, things would usually amp up and get to sort of the level that people would find 
probably a little bit spooky and a little bit scary. She also used to have ghosts flying around in the room as well. And a couple of times when these were illuminated, it was very clear to see that they weren't proper ghosts. A child's vest stuffed with newspaper. There would be Halloween masks on sticks, sheets over things. And if you cut Helen Duncan as well, you'll be able to see some some pictures of her while she's in her trance with her ghosts flying around her, which don't look a lot like ghosts. <laughs> Paper mache people on a coat hanger. Oh, I've seen those pictures. That's Helen Duncan. Oh, Helen Duncan. She not a crafter. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it seems to have been effective. At the time. Yeah. That's why you gotta have seances in the dark, so that you just, like, you just catch a glimpse. Yeah. And what she is most famous for, ectoplasm. Oh! Now, Helen could produce a huge, long stream of stuff (laughs) that would come out of her mouth, sometimes, according to witnesses, her mouth, her nose, and her chest. Ooh. And these ectoplasms used to be able to be pulled out of her mouth and then delivered to the room um, for inspection. This was (laughs) Helen Duncan's claim to fame. Ha! They actually still have some of Helen Duncan's ectoplasm (gasps) at Cambridge. What? Oh, I have to go and see that. Yes, I. it's definitely on my list. I never thought that I would be gunning to see a piece of gauze on display. <laughs> now, you don't know what it is. Oh, it might be ectoplasm. Other, otherworldly goo. Yeah. But all of the tests done on it have found that it is cheesecloth. Oh, but that's biased science. They just call it cheesecloth because they don't have a way to measure it. Exactly. Ectoplasm. And who's to say the spirits can't create yeah. cheesecloth? Yes. Yes. On other occasions... Helen Duncan's ectoplasm was examined and determined to be toilet paper and egg whites. But the real question here is, Helen Duncan is often strip searched before her seances to prove that she does not have any ectoplasm on her person. Mm. So where is the ectoplasm coming from? Oh, no. Is she... Possibly swallowing it, vomiting up. <gasps> yes, swallowing and vomiting up cheesecloth. But Nikki Druce does note one small fact. She used to have quite a lot of nosebleeds when she was doing her seances. Wait. So it's possible she had it in of her sinuses. Her sinuses. <gasps> yeah. Either way, serious commitment. Ooh. Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor, Girls Can Crate. It really is the perfect time to start a subscription to Girls Can Crate. Every month, they'll deliver a brand new real-life Shiro to your front door, introducing kids to a fascinating woman who changed the world, complete with a gorgeous 28-page activity book, all the materials for two to three STEAM activities like experiments, art projects, and more. Girls Can Crate is a lifesaver for anyone trying to homeschool, hybrid school, or just entertain their kids, and it's a wonderful educational surprise for any kid from ages 5 to 10. For busy families, they have digital subscriptions and mini crates too. Check them out now at girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E, dot com, and use the coupon code HERNAME, all one word, to get 20% off your first month's crate. Now, as you may have noticed from the fact that we have photos Mm -hmm. and cheesecloth on display, Helen Duncan was repeatedly thoroughly debunked Mm. all throughout the 1920s and 1930s. She was caught with her ghosts during a seance by a man who snuck in a flash camera and took a photo mid-seance. Oh, they're the greatest. And proved that it is a mask on a stick. Yeah. I just love those photos. 
They're fantastic photos. And the mask is so creepy. But oh, creepy yeah, in a, extremely creepy. And not like a, ooh, that's a scary ghost kind of way, but like a, whoa. Yeah, Uncanny Valley kind of yeah. something, yeah. In 1931, a famous debunker, Harry Price, paid her 50 pounds to let him test her. Many of these tests went pretty smoothly until Price wheeled in an x-ray machine. Uh. And at that point, Helen Duncan had what was described as an attack of hysterics, dealt Harry Price a smashing blow in the face, dashed out into the street where she was screaming, flailing around, tearing at her clothes <laughs> until her husband finally calmed her down. And then she immediately came back in and demanded an x-ray. Ah, uh, wow. Harry Price, who was pretty convinced that she had just relieved herself of the ectoplasm out in the street during this display, yep. refused to do an x-ray at this point. Yep. Her former maid even confessed in detail to having helped her with these tricks that she was pulling. During one particularly eventful seance, a man in the second row leaped up and grabbed the spiritual manifestation and discovered that it was a vest stuffed with newspaper. <laughs> and the police were called. Duncan was prosecuted and fined 10 pounds. Mm. And every time she just carries on like nothing has happened. And I think this is just remarkable proof of the astonishing power of not caring what people think about you. Mm. <laughs> As I have gotten older, I, you know, I always heard that one of the beautiful things about turning 40 is you stop caring what people think about you. Mm -hmm. And I will say it is really empowering to finally just not care at all, mm -hmm. at least about what people I don't care about yeah. think about me. Yeah. And so it can be a really good force for good. You can do amazing things when you don't care totally. what anyone else thinks. Huh. I think we've also seen it can be pretty dangerous when a person is totally shameless and that when things which should be and would be career ending uh -huh. for anyone else just kind of float past. Yeah. <laughs> because our society depends on people having some shame on that sense of like you've been caught out and and now it's over. Mm -hmm. And people who just refuse to respond normally to that, we don't have outlets for that in society. Like, we don't know what to do with people who just yeah. lie in plain sight so they get away with it. Maybe she proved that it's a very effective method of getting away with things. <laughs> it definitely adds... It, we've, we've seen it that a bit in the last few years. Yep. Just don't Nobody can do anything When about someone it. tries to call you out on it, yeah. just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so she's kind of a low-grade operator, small seances, small time, and suddenly in the early 1940s, she becomes extraordinarily popular. And it's not known whether it's because of the spectacle that she was creating and it being more of a show than actually her being talented and gifted at being able to deliver these seances. But it was quite interesting for people to just go and see it. So some people went out of curiosity and I'm sure some people went out of a staunch belief that she was able to do this stuff. In November 1941... She is in Portsmouth giving a seance. Obviously, Portsmouth as a place was very, very important during the war because massive naval base there. And from there, quite a lot of the, the big boats left to go into the war and to fight from there. She charged about 12 shillings a ticket, which is about five pounds in today's money. So um, not the most expensive of things. So she would have been aiming her market at people that were not necessarily rich as such, but they would have been people that had those families that were fighting in the Navy. During that time as well, it was during the blackout, so everything would have added to the atmosphere of the time. There was no light outside. It would have been a completely pitch black room. They would have all been huddled together, so it would have really added to this whole atmosphere. During this seance, she started off as normal. She tried to contact Albert, but he didn't want to play that evening. He decided that he didn't want to make an appearance. And strangely, somebody called Sid arrived instead. 
and Sid began talking through her, saying that he had been sent to let everybody in the room know that the HMS Barham had been sunk. Sid appeared in full form as an actual ghost, wearing a naval hat, which uh, had the hat band HMS Barham upon it. And Sid did deliver the news that the Barham had been sunk and all that were on board had died, which at the time was a military secret. So Helen had just spewed forth into the room a military secret. Whoa! This is a huge deal. The audience is thrilled and horrified. Mm -hmm. Especially the people in the room who have family members who were serving on the HMS Barham. Whoa. And this is Portsmouth, so that's a lot of people. Yeah. Family members who were there on the evening who had loved ones on the HMS Barham had actually already been informed that the Barham had been sunk. Now, they're sitting in the audience knowing that this is true, Ah. but not allowed to say anything, but looking at each other in the audience because you know that everyone you know who has a brother on the ship also knows. Mm. Yeah, there was 861 people died. Probably the majority of those people did come from Portsmouth or the surrounding area. So that was a large percentage of the room probably already knew that fact. (laughs) So, obviously, with this many relatives in the know and possibly searching for closure with their dead relatives, how Helen Duncan got this information is not particularly hard to guess. Unfortunately for Helen, there were several police officers in the audience who reported this. This wasn't her first offence of spilling military secrets. In Edinburgh, she had reported another sinking ship, And at that point, an admiral was in the audience. (gasps) And he had not heard anything about this. So he calls in to see, is this true? Did this ship sink? Is there anything? And he was told, no, there's been nothing reported by the official Navy switchboard. And then the next morning, he gets a call that the HMS Hood had been sunk by the Bismarck. But it had not yet even been reported to the Navy at the point that Helen makes this announcement. Wow. Yeah, that one? Hard to explain. Yeah. Wow. How does she know? Pretty disconcerting, right? Again, we have to rethink, what if she is actually doing something here? She is communicating with the dead, or she is psychic, or she does have access to something. Huh that is giving her some of this information. And then as everyone else ups their showmanship, she has to up hers. And so she's a real medium pretending to be a fake medium. Wow. (laughs) It's a really weird turn of events. Obviously this then got back to the authorities again. And this made her quite a prominent character that they were keeping an eye on. Because if she was able to to do this and then reveal those military secrets to a room full of people, then that was obviously quite a problem. (laughs) If she keeps doing this, she could blow the whole operation for the end of World War II. And the closer we get to D-Day, the more of a real security threat she begins to look like oh. because she keeps dropping these bombshell announcements months before they're supposed to be made public oh my gosh and this is why she is tried for witchcraft because mm. there's nothing else they can charge her with she <laughs> you can't charge her with espionage because they can't prove it They can't prove it and they don't want anyone to know that what she's saying is true If they say she's committing espionage, they have to admit that the things she is saying actually happened. And those are state secrets. (laughs) That's awesome. So she was arrested in Portsmouth and charged with vagrancy because they didn't know what else to charge her for. And then she was taken to London and that's where she was put on trial for around about a month or so. 
The only evidence that they could provide, because how do you prove if right. someone is talking to the dead or not, was physical evidence. So they bring in some of the ectoplasm. This mm. is just cheesecloth. We can prove it. Mm -hmm. And they have the hat band from Sid's hat. Whoa. The hat band, which was bought from the event of the sinking of the HMS Barham, which was what the ghost was wearing at the time. Somebody had managed to secure that from the evening. And this kind of dobbed her in, really, and got her in trouble because, well, she'd overlooked the fact that at that time uniforms had changed because there was such a quick turnaround and they were putting so many troops out so quickly that the production of uniforms was completely different as to how it used to be. So it used to be that a hat band would be printed with the name of the ship, but it wasn't anymore. So that proves that this hat cannot be from the ghost of Sid who drowned on the HMS Barham. Wow. It proves that she is a fraud. <gasps> now, but I if she's... you take a second to think about yeah. what I just said. Right. If you prove she's a fraud, she's not a witch. Exactly. She is on trial for witchcraft, and the evidence produced to convict her is proof that she is not practicing witchcraft. Yeah. What? It proves, I think, definitively that everyone involved knows what she's actually on trial for. Wow. That this isn't about witchcraft. This is about shutting her up. Oh. And it worked. Oh. She was convicted. Of witchcraft. Eventually. Okay. The trial dragged on and on and on. Part of that is because there is a slight distraction going on in London right mm. now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bombs were falling at the time. And obviously you can't stay in court at the Old Bailey when you're getting <laughs> bombed. <laughs> They have to adjourn the trial, flee to the bomb shelters, <laughs> and reschedule. Dang. She was eventually found guilty and sent to Holloway Prison for nine months. Hmm. You know, okay. better than right. would have yeah. fared in better the than 17th century. Burning her alive in front of a massive crowd. But I think the reason that they probably charged her the time inside was reasonable. So it was enough to teach her a lesson to make sure that she didn't do it again. But it was also a low enough charge to not put her away for years and years, which something like theft, she could have been away for three years. But <laughs> witchcraft is only nine months. Okay. This case is a national sensation, of course. I bet. Everyone is talking about it. Even Churchill, you think that he would be busy during the war, but apparently he also made a statement on it, and he said the case was absolute tomfoolery and a complete waste of resources, <laughs> which I am inclined to agree. <laughs> yeah. And she is the very last person in the UK ever to be convicted of yeah. witchcraft. That's amazing. Are those laws so, still on the books? Like, could you still get arrested <laughs> no, today? No, so the good news is, thanks to Helen, and largely as a result of this trial and the absolute tomfoolery, <laughs> the Witchcraft Act was finally abolished in 1951, and huh. the Fraudulent Medium Act put in its place. Oh! <laughs> so, huh. congratulations, UK listeners. You are safe from... Witchcraft convictions. Cool. She's released from prison. She promises that she will not hold any more seances. And then she immediately goes back to Scotland and begins holding seances. <laughs> but she moved back to Scotland and decided to, to basically keep it on the down low and be a bit quieter. These are small seances in her home, not wow. giant packed halls. And she's no longer releasing state secrets. Yeah. In 1956, police raided her while she was in the middle of a seance one evening. Because now, of course, the Fraudulent Medium Act has been established and she's really, truly not supposed to be doing this. And she said that she was in a very, very deep trance and it took her out of it. 
she's very upset and throughout the rest of the day she keeps complaining that she's really not feeling well and that evening she died what yep of what her followers of course blamed the police raid yeah but also eulogized her the people that followed her and liked her said that the spirits decided to keep her for their own while she was in a trance which i thought was very nice (laughs) Mm. the general medical opinion now is that she was in very poor health and just it was bad timing and she just happened to die that evening Mm. but either way that's the end of helen duncan wow or is it? <gasps> right, she's a medium, of course. Right, if anyone's going to come back. Yeah. It should be Helen Duncan. Right. And she did make a brief appearance at a seance in the UK in 1983. What? And I mean a very brief appearance. <laughs> she appeared to wish happy birthday to another spirit, a nine-year-old boy who was celebrating his birthday from the other side with his brother's family and various other well-wishers. Okay. And Helen dropped by mainly to encourage all the living attendees to remember folks who are alone on their birthdays. Really? And it would help to pop a card through the door of those that we know are alone. Oh. We have audio of this too. Wait, what? I want to welcome you all here again. I know we're doing a lot of welcoming tonight. It's lovely. And birthdays are special days. Mm. Mm. Especially when you're sharing them with someone, you know? Mm. Exactly. Mm. And I've got an awful lot of people in the world that have their birthdays alone, you know? Give you a little food for thought, you know, to just now and again think of drop somebody that's on their own and think, I only just pop a little card through the door, you know. Yes. Even if from say your fairy godmother. You know what? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Alright dear, we'll go on. So perhaps the last words of Helen Duncan (laughs) urging us all to be kind to one another and to watch out for the lonely. Amen, Helen. That's a pretty good legacy to go out on. I love that. I would trek back through the darkness of the afterlife to tell people to send more cards. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very British thing to do, right? It is. Huge thanks to Nikki Druce from Macabre London. You can find Macabre London anywhere you find podcasts. And on our website, there are links to her YouTube show and to her website and all the resources that we've mentioned in this episode, as well as photos of Helen Duncan and her spirits. If you'd like to join us on the very first What's Your Name Women's History Tour, we are headed to England in September of 2021, assuming everything goes well. You can find all of that information on our website as well. Music for this episode was provided by Kevin McLeod, Half Pelican, Amanda Setlick Wilson, Jeremy Didis, and Doug Maxwell. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Our intern is Grace Stearnley. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.